It's the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, the Arsenal show brought to you by 90 Min. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing the wider implementation of VAR and whether or not David Luiz should have been sent off at Molyneux last night. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to another live edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by 90 Min. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon. After a very, very frustrating night for Arsenal fans, there's been a lot of discussion around one of the key refereeing decisions in the game. So I thought, who better to join me on the show than former top-level referee, former head of the PGMOL, and a great friend of the show than the brilliant Keith Hackett. Welcome, mate. How are you, first of all? I'm fine, Harry. Delighted to be on your show and no doubt ready to take the bullets when they're fired. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're delighted to have you, Keith, really are. And, and I appreciate that you agreed to do this at such short notice as well. So for me, yeah. um, I, I just want to express my thanks for that, because I know uh, from even just posting it on Twitter earlier on that we were going to do this. I've had lots of questions come over, um, lots of thoughts, and, and there's plenty to, to get our teeth into. So let, let's focus, first of all, We'll come on to talk about the wider implementation of VAR in a moment. But first of all, let's focus on what unfolded at Molyneux last night. Um, David Luiz gets caught the wrong side of the defender. And um, I'll kind of tell you, uh, the wrong side of the attacker, I should say. I'll kind of tell you how I saw the incident. And then you can tell us how you yeah. saw it as a referee. Yeah, sure. For me... David Luiz initially gets caught out of position. I think even the most ardent of Arsenal fans can agree that. The ball's played in behind. Uh, Willian Jose is the striker. Naturally, as a striker, I think you, in that position, you you naturally start to slow down a little bit. You're trying to compose yourself for the shot. And David Luiz's momentum has led to a tiny bit of contact, which has essentially knocked the player off balance. He's gone down. Um, I personally am okay with the penalty being awarded. What frustrates me is the fact that that David Luiz has been sent off. Now, we talk a lot about intent. We talk a lot about whether it was a genuine attempt to win the ball. For me, the, David Luiz has not made an attempt to do anything other than catch up to the player. And that's why I find it so frustrating. W what are your thoughts on on the incident and, and how it was uh, seen by the officials on the night? Well, I think you've described it really well, Harry. Um I saw it in similar fashion. Um, and then you look at it and then you look at the law. And and I want I want to emphasize the law because I'm not hiding behind the law. As, as a football fan, right, the last thing I want to see is players getting sent off. You know, as a as a referee, I think in a career spanning about 23 years at the top level, I sent about 10 players off. So, so the whole aspect now is, let's have a look at this situation. Did it come as a surprise? To some degree, it did. And how can we justify what the referee has done? Understanding that I believe that Arsenal will appeal uh, this situation. So what the law says is that a care a careless so it comes under the banner of careless he's committed a foul right he's been careless and so in that sense um he's, he's shown a lack of attention and uh and, and he acts without precaution that's what the law says and, but i don't want to hide behind the law because that's the foundation on which the decision has been made the referee said there's contact it's careless. It's a penalty kick. Now, here comes the other added, if you like, downside, is that immediately he's given a penalty kick. Uh, the player is in uh, an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. He's facing goal, balls almost at his feet. 
so now we've got a situation where the act by David Luiz has denied an obvious goal scoring opportunity. So he's, he's got to give a penalty kick and red card. And I want to go back to the fact that I made voices years ago when I was boss of the PGMR saying the, the penalty of an offence inside the penalty area, not the penalty itself, but the penalty to the, to the player is too big. And therefore, I was one that pressured people to say, look, we want to change. And they changed the law. They changed the law saying not every foul inside the penalty area when it denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity is a red card. So what it, what it says is that if David Louise last night in, in coming together with his, his, the, the opponent showed more caution in his approach, and perhaps even attempted to play the ball, it would have been a yellow card. And that's the law. So, so let so me he's, just... He's not, he's not attempted to play the ball. If he'd attempted to play the ball, right, a tattle, a challenge, not a pull, not a complete wipeout, uh, a challenge that is, it can be meaty, if you like, but he's gone to challenge the player for the ball, then in that sense, um, it's not a red card, it's a yellow. So let, let, me, let me just clarify that, Keith, because from my perspective, what we're essentially saying is that if David Luiz makes a sliding challenge to try and get the ball and takes the player out as a result of that, that is deemed as a genuine attempt to win the ball and therefore he'll only be shown a yellow card. And, my, a, penalty kick. and a penalty kick will be given, right. My issue with this is that David Luiz has attempted to do nothing. So he's essentially been punished for doing nothing. He could have made a challenge to purposely take out the player and disguised it as a genuine attempt to win the ball and got away with less punishment. So surely that's exposed a grey area in the law. Yes. And, and, I, and I think that it, I think it's going to be interesting. And, I, you know, I'm, in a way, I'm pleased that Arsenal are going to appeal because it then will bring it like the Rodri offence last week on the offside. Mm -hmm. it, these things will be then considered and then perhaps an interpretation or further guidance might be given to the referee in terms of the law application. So the first bit is, and this is where I think are the grounds for Arsenal's appeal, is did the contact with the player come under a careless challenge? That's 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 the question. I think that the that the panel of three players, I think that I think a player, a former player, a former manager, and, and usually a referee will sit on that panel and they will examine and discuss in the same way that we're discussing. Hopefully, the outcome. Now, for me, I'm not going to lose any sleep whatsoever. Having said today that I think that in the Daily Telegraph that uh, David Luiz, Arsenal Football Club, need perhaps to call in the PGMOL to discuss this type of incident. They, you know, this is not for the first time that David Luiz has been sent off. But does that play a part, Keith? Does that play a part? It is as a referee, and and you know, you talking openly and honestly as a referee. Yeah. Will a player's previous be in the back of your mind? Will it me maybe even subconsciously play a part in in you coming to the decision that you do? Well, I can't I can't say it won't because I don't know, Harry. But but let me tell you that the modern referee goes into games much more much better prepared and understanding and knowing the players than in, in my day where, you know, we, did, we didn't have the time. We were amateurs in a professional environment in my day. Now they're professional, they have time, they can study anal and, and analyse games very carefully and prepare well. So there might be an element of that. But in fairness to Pawson, who, who's a referee, I, if you look back on the history, I've criticised him because at times, his shortfall has been his poor positioning and 
lack of, if you like, proximity to play to make the big calls. And he's fallen on those at times, made errors. So on this one, I think he's in a reasonably good position to make a judgment. And, uh, and what he's done is he, he's clearly judged that this is a careless challenge and that uh, David Luiz has acted without precaution. And he's then recognised that the outcome is the ultimate sanction. Now, we, we can argue until the cows come home. For me, it's pretty tough. And I and I don't I think that I don't you know the referees made the right call in law, but is the law correct in penalising a player in this situation? You know I've been reading some of the comments that have come onto my own social uh, media platform, and and I think it's quite interesting because I think some of the arguments that are put forward uh, are logical questions that have been asked. And that is, did the challenge, was it first of all a challenge, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the first thing. Was it, was it a foul? Well, the law says he's acted without precaution. But then we have to test that and say, did he? Because we don't know what's in the mind of David Louise. All we have is, is a picture, a snapshot of a picture that says, that's a foul or it's not a foul. So, in in that instance, wasn't the whole point of bringing VAR in and having the monitors on the side of the pitch to? And we've spoken about VAR in the past, Keith. We, we both agreed that it's not there to make decisions for people. It's a tool to provide the, the the right pictures to help the referee get to the right call in the end. So, in that case, where P, where the referee maybe isn't 100% sure about whether it is a challenge or it isn't a challenge or, you know, whether it was an attempt to win the ball or whether it was careless. Shouldn't he go over to the monitor and have a look and be able to then make a a, a rational call rather than just brandishing the red card and, and letting the player walk off the pitch? Well, first of all, it, it, before it can be reviewed, right, he's got to show the red card. So he's, he's actually... In the process, he's shown the red card. Now, I, I this is where I have a, you know, this is where the dis- debate and discussion on VAR goes. Because for me, I would have liked Craig Porson to have another view, to, to go to the monitor, calm down, have another look, to justify his actions and to sell to me and you, the supporter, and the player, the accuracy of his call, rather than perhaps tomorrow or the day after going in front of three people sat around a table, having studied all the laws of the game and looked at it in microscopic fashion to suddenly say, yeah, we agree that David Luiz's red card stands. So, yeah, I think that what we're seeing is um, an involvement of the VAR, a different operation in VAR by the PGMOL this season. I have no doubts that we saw interference and far too much reliance on VAR. As a result of that, referees become lazy. They, 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 the concentration, level of awareness and concentration dips a few percentage points because they've suddenly got an insurance premium Back at the side of the pitch. Yeah. So that's where that sits. And this is why I argue and continue to argue that in decisions like this, I would like the referee to have another look, to sell the decision. Now, because of that change of emphasis this season, and it didn't, this wasn't at the start of the season, this is part way through the season, when we all got slightly concerned because we were seeing an overindulgence of the VAR saying, look at me, I'm at Stockley Park, I've got to justify why I'm here. And what we've seen in recent weeks is I think they're moving towards what was the initial criteria, which remains the criteria of serious and obvious error. So I suggest that maybe because of that change, VAR decided 
I'm not coming in because I don't see it as a serious and obvious error. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing that what Craig Pawson has, Pawson has done, he's seen it as a foul, right? There is contact. So he's made that judgment. It is a penalty kick. You, Harry, had a view that it was a penalty kick, right? Um, and if he gives a penalty kick, the player's got to go because he's denied an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. How you determine that, Harry, practically is this. You're looking at the game. You take away the you take away David Luiz in that challenge and you say if that challenge had not been made or that foul had not been committed right <coughs> because you and I agreed that it wasn't a challenge it was a that uh, David Luiz acted without precaution um, and in that sense he's caught his opponent now these questions again of was this a manufactured contact by his opponent. Certainly looked that way. And, and I could look at it that way. And, you know, here's the ball in front of goal with a, with a player. Why didn't he have a shot? Why, why has he gone to ground? Now, we have seen this season and towards the back end of last season an increasing number of players going to ground rather easily because I think they've been coached that if they touch in the penalty area, they stay on the feet they're not going to get a penalty kick. If they go down, then the, the, the chances are a higher chance of getting a penalty kick awarded. So these are the dilemmas for the game to actually answer. And these, if you like, are the scenarios that referees operate in. Craig Pawson's got one view. He's seen the player go down. He's seen and probably heard contact. And he's gone penalty kick. And then he's gone, oh, it's a red card. Off you go. So these are the areas where, you know, you've, you've got to, you, I mean, I always said to referees, don't guess and, and sell the decision. And I, and I think we're getting into a world of, you know, trying to be too precise and not That's taking it, into yeah. account the environment of the game. We're, we're, we're all getting a bit, fear factor you know i mean somebody wrote me today and he said uh, keith you're hiding behind the laws of the game well in a in a in a, in a twitter or or whatever social media i can't go into the detail harry that i'm going into now of course of course and, and the ba the basis is that it seems a very harsh punishment to me for what David Louise has done. Yeah. And and it seems that the jeopardy on the player is too much. The the, the actual penalty to, of that player, a red card, and a penalty kick, and a suspension, potentially, is hell of a punishment. For an area, uh, exactly. On an area that you and I are arguing. You and I... I probably have a very clear explanation from you that says contact was there. And I'm saying, well, does contact say that that is a careless challenge? And did David Louise act with, with, without precaution? That allows me as a referee to say that's a free kick, that is a penalty kick, and then I've got to send him off. Yeah, it's just it, it's a it's a it's a hell of a punishment. The law, look, I, I keep using the word the laws and that's, but it seems to me that how can we punish a player uh, when for this type of incident? When further down the line, we might have a player that's almost put someone in hospital, and he gets a yellow card because the referees judge it as care, as reckless. And not with excessive force. You see, see the point I'm getting at. Yeah, it's just th th there are so many grey areas, and because there are grey areas, I think football fans in general, and not just Arsenal fans, and you know, we'll come on to talk about a little bit about the wider implementation now. But I think football fans in general are just wanting to see a little bit of common sense applied at times. We understand, though, on the other hand, that 
when you've got a, a set of laws, the only way I guess you can get consistency is by applying those laws to the letter of the law. The problem is we're not seeing that every week. And we're seeing, no. you know, we saw on the same night, we saw an almost identical incident in the game between Manchester United and Southampton in which Mike Dean went over to the the, the monitor, still got it wrong in my opinion, but went over to the monitor, had a look at it and and, and then has made it, you know, has, has decided to stick with his decision. So it's why is it that Sometimes we're going to the monitors, sometimes we're not. And and my big question to you, Keith, would be, have because I watch a lot of European football, in particular Serie A, and I know that VAR is not without its controversies in Italy, but it's nowhere near as frequent no, as it is here. No. And, and, and why have the Premier League decided to go their own way on VAR? Why have they added sort of little nuances to the way it's being applied that they feel are are better than the other leagues when actually what we're seeing is the spectacle of what's supposed to be the, the best league to watch. It's certainly the most valuable league in terms of the money that's involved in it. And it feels as though it is falling behind everyone else. And the, the game is being spoiled by a lack of consistency in the application of the system. Well, I think first of all, Ari, a lot is, is down to how you manage the squad of referees. You know, a lot is on the shoulders of Mike Riley to actually say, you know, I, I worry because at the moment I've been very critical of some of the referees in the in the PGM group. I, I I don't think they're good enough. That's the first bit. So I don't think got, Mike Riley was ever good enough either. That's the problem. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that what you've got is you've got to some degree you're getting Mike Riley clones within referee exactly. manufactured. And, and that's for another day and another argument because I have big issues with that. But then if I go too loud on it, people say, well, you would say that because you're the guy that left the, left the priest. Uh, when I was, was the boss of the PGM world, I, I tried and attempted to be transparent, totally transparent. And I can remember Fellani at Everton um, committing... 10 yellow cards in his first 10 games. And, and as the boss of the PGM, well, I rang, I rang David Moyes and said, look, I'd like to come to uh, Farmfield, Liverpool. I, I'd like to discuss with you, with the player, the, his actions so that we can perhaps reduce the number of yellow cards. Now, that might have been seen as unfair, but I would prepare to do that and did that with other clubs as well. You know, I, I visited Arsene Wenger at Radley to talk about refereeing issues, as I did with Ferguson at, at Carrington and very and, and most managers, I would go. So I think transparency is important, and I don't I don't want to get off the, the 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 scenario. There is inconsistency, and there there is a lack of personality to some degree. I don't I don't think that's a fear factor because when when I was the boss. They said, oh, all the referees are operating on the fear. The fear for me was if you didn't perform, you weren't appointed the following week. And if you weren't, if I deemed you weren't good enough and I gave you all the operational advice that was around me and I would use coaches, sports psychologists, sports scientists, all that stuff to improve the referee's performance. But if I didn't get the level of improvement, that referee wouldn't, wouldn't stay on the list. So I think that that there's a lack of transparency. And, you know, we don't have assessors at the game anymore. Uh, former referees watching and discussing and going in and, and talking about the practicality practicalities of officiating. And, and now I'm getting slightly off the subject because I think that we are seeing less scope for the referee under the, under the microscope of the sort of media to actually use what I consider an important aspect of refereeing, and that's personality. And, and you know, to say, I don't, I don't think that applies. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I've seen that challenge. It's accidental. I've made the judgment I'm not giving it. But, you know, if we look at the law, and I go back to denial of an obvious goal-scoring opportunity, I, along with the LMA and others, said, we, this is triple jeopardy. Red card, team goes down to 10. That's the first. Penalty kick, a chance to score. 
So it's the, that, that opportunity was taken away, is replaced, and then a suspension. And so along came the view that I had in others was, look, if the offence takes place in the penalty area, it's not uh, violent conduct or it's not serious foul play, then the player's not going to be sent off. That's it. Yeah. But then what they do is they bring in the fight. He's got to be seen to be challenging for the ball in order for it not to be a red card. And this is where you and I and fans of Arsenal and up and down the country will argue it is, is uh, what was David Luiz doing? Could he have avoided contact or put in a challenge? Yeah, he, he could have. He was better off, essentially. He was better off making a sliding challenge, taking the player down, maybe even earlier outside the penalty area. And it yeah. would have been a, a much better outcome for Arsenal. And, and actually, you know, when I first watched it, just going back to that incident quickly, and, and actually, before I do that, let me just remind everybody in the live chat, because there's lots of you watching us live at the moment, make sure if you've got any questions, put them in the chat now, because I know you've been putting some in, but they've they've gone up the chat and they've disappeared. So get your questions in and we'll do that for the last few minutes. Um a big thank you to Nadine as well, who's just signed up to become a member of the channel. If you're interested in uh, becoming a member, getting access to our uh, members-only content and, of course, uh, some of the other perks that are available, just click on the link in the description. Check out the three tiers available, and we'd love to have you on board. Also, make sure you smash the like button as well. That is very, very important. Going back to, to kind of that incident, uh, just finally, before we, we go on to questions, for me, you know... It's when I first saw it, I thought David Luiz must have tugged him back here. You know, he must have he must have done something that has indicated that he's tried to foul the player. And and you know, David Luiz, that's why I was talking about his previous earlier on because he has done that in the past. And mm. as an Arsenal fan, having seen that on a number of occasions, the first thing that comes to your head is, "Oh, great, David's done it again." And and so. It just feels like actually David Luiz may have, and I can't know this for sure, but he may have learned his lesson in that situation and just try to bear down on the player a little bit, put a bit of pressure on him. And then he's been sent off anyway. So he might as well literally have just uh, just taken him, <laughs> might as well have just taken him out. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole argument, Harry, is uh, the, the, the disciplinary panel will, will have to make a judgment on is. Uh, was it a foul? That, that's 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 the judgment that that Horson made that it was a foul, and uh, and then you know I mean I I read uh, Mark Clattenburg's view because Clattenburg says porson has got it wrong; it shouldn't have been a send off. And remember, a very experienced referee who I used to manage, but it, but it, in it in his in his column in the Daily Mail, he's he's he sort of said. It, it was a, an accidental foul. Well, it's a, it's a foul, it, yeah. You can't have it an accidental foul. So, so you have to go back to law and to justify Orson's case is that he's judged it as careless. And he's, ju he's judged that David Luiz has acted without precaution. And that is the foundation of why he's given the foul. But Why should is should that challenge as a foul? Should careless warrant a red card in your opinion? Well, it doesn't. It's just a foul. So, so that careless, that careless. Let's put it. Let's make it clear. He's committed a foul. Now, in committing that foul, if if that is the judgment, right? He's committed a foul because he's committed, and the player's gone down because of that. He's denied the forward, the opportunity of an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. He's not being sent off. He's being sent off because it, it's like a pack of cards. It sort of says, you foul somebody in the penalty area without attempting to play the ball, right? You've made contact with the player. That's a foul. That's the judgment of Borson. And in doing so, you've denied an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. That now converts to a penalty kick and red card. So, so, so how do we get a run on that going forward now? Should there be one that says 
if it's if you've if you've made a genuine attempt to win the ball, you don't get sent off. What happens if you've made no attempt to win the ball? No attempt, to, it, like David Luiz has probably done, where he's just literally caught up to the player and there's been a tiny little accidental clash. How do we fix this going forward? Would you add a little bit of further guidance in there? What, no, what I, would you I, do? No, I, I, think, I think, first of all, that's why you and I are on the same page with regard to saying, go and have a look at the monitor. And, and in doing so, you're having an opportunity to review what you've given. And, in, and if you stay with the same decision, you're actually confirming that you've made the right call. But, and, and people might just be a touch more comfortable. Yeah. But because there's no review. There wasn't a review. Uh, you, you're then left with, just a minute, this is a very tight call for which... In, in any football parlance, no matter what team you support, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Yeah. That's the sum total of it, Harry. Uh, yeah. You know, give the penalty kick, fine. But, he's, but the referee is, is stuck in the laws of the game. Now, the, question, the, the old scenario, without repeating myself, is was the judgment of the referee in terms of the actions of Louise, correct. Was it a foul? And I think that is the basis of the argument that will be put forward by Arsenal Football Club in their appeal. So if you were, if you were heading the PGMO now, what would you do with the appeal? Would you accept it? Would you, would you say that Arsenal have, have a genuine case here? Well, in, in, in the position of the PGMO, as a boss, formerly, I had no influence on the outcome of that discipline. It goes completely independent. Okay. So it, you know, the the, the club the club have applied the video. They've applied their view, right, and they put forward their case that they're making an appeal, justifying that the decision that has been made is incorrect. And then three people from different aspects of uh, football will sit down and, and make a judgment on on whether the red card was correct or whether it should be rescinded and that, that's the judgment that will be made and look Harry there are times when I get surprised by some of the decisions they make but they're, sure they're, they are. <laughs> they're, they're coming from a, they're coming from a different aspect and I, and I don't want to be seen to be an individual the designing behind the written law. I, I start off with the premise that given the law, given what the referee's done, he's, he's made the right call. Is it good for football? Answer, no. So that's when you start to examine and say, the law here needs to be reviewed with a, an ability to change. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Completely yeah. agree, Keith. Um, let's throw some of these questions at you just quickly as well um, and see uh, some of your thoughts on these. Let me just pick out a few at random. Apologies if I don't get to yours. There are so many um, that I just want to quickly um, get a few uh, over to Keith. Uh, hold on. Here we go. This is one from Scott Mason. Keith, do you think there will ever be uh, an in-game appeal challenge process as in the, like there is in tennis, whereby you get a certain amount per game? Um, I don't think it will. I think that what we've got to understand is that um, I don't want a situation where a manager has expended his appeals and then after that we get an incident that should have gone to an appeal. Are you with me? Yeah. So let's say the manager's got, he's got a maximum of two appeals in a game and he uses those in the first half and he gets a similar incident in the second, he's no right of appeal. And that seems to me that what we've got to do is we've got to say to the officials, look, you've got to get better at it. You know, we want improvements in the system. We want, we want to try to get to a position where rugby union has got to. We, we, we need VAR to be totally transparent. Yeah. You know, we want to listen to the referee looking at the big screen in the stadium and talking it through. So as spectators, 
you know, stakeholders in the game, we can we can understand and believe. Hey, what what is the question he's asking here? How has he come to that decision? We might then buy into it. You know, I mean, we've we've not even touched on on the offside calls that's been made in recent days because. If you talk to me about VAR and offside, I'll say that that is a complete nonsense in the game. Where you're, you're actually saying, look, a millimetre, you're offside. When in fact, I know the technology is not good enough to give me that millimetre. Uh -huh. And so the MLS don't use the lines. And they, they, don't, they don't have much controversy on offsides. They get it, but they don't have as many. I didn't know so, that. I didn't know they didn't, didn't use the line, so, so that's interesting. So I think, you know, there are areas where it's it's a tool to aid the referee and it's got it it's improving slowly, but not quickly enough for me. Yeah, agreed. Uh, this one comes from Gunatel, one of our members. He says, Keith, do referees and clubs have a say in the rule changes season on season? This one seems to have a lot of grey areas and I'm surprised it was never challenged prior to it being implemented. Well, I, I think you've got to understand that the laws of the game are, are the responsibility of the International Football Association Board, not the Football Association. And the International Football Association Board has uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and FIFA. And they make up the panel, and it's got to be a majority decision. What has happened in uh, recent times is that uh, you've now got David Ellery, the former referee, as technical director, and they have business meetings. And in those business meetings, people like Arsene Wenger, now uh, uh, you've got other other players, uh, Lawrence Figo, I think, and others that sit on what is effectively a business meeting. But, you know, this, for me, the worry is, and I've edited a technical meeting committee. It meets once a month. In the case of the business, it meets twice a year, I think. It, it's not enough. It, you know, the game's evolving all the time. You need to examine. You need to question the laws. You need... It, they're modified on an annual basis, and they have to get through that voting scenario. And, you know, then what happens is they come out with a written law, and then we get the grey area of interpretation. And look how grey it can get with the handball situations that we've had this season in the Premier League. So, yeah, I mean, the Matty Cash one was a prime example just not long ago the game between Villa and Southampton. That was, I know it took a slight touch off the thigh, but surely that's, and as is pointed out in the comments, surely that's more of a denial of a goal-scoring opportunity um, than some of the other incidents we're seeing red cards for. Well, under the laws of the game now, right, and this is, at the beginning of the season, we had situations where it came off the, the, the knee of somebody, came up and a penalty kick was given, right? We had the one at the weekend, where it wasn't because the, the interpretations changed. We, you and I don't know that. I know because of my experience as a referee. Yeah. And I know that we were getting too many handballs being penalised that weren't accurate in, in law. So the old question, and it's a very good question, um, I don't think we only debate the laws when we have conflict. Yeah. And, and, and therefore... And I think it's right. I, I don't, you know, uh, we should be test driving the laws. We should have involvement from current managers who can express their concerns. It, it, look, in my time, it used to happen once a year with a formal meeting with managers. And I would stand there and I'd stand up and say, guys, we've got a problem here with simulation. I've got to tell you, one week you're going to get a penalty kick the next we're not because the players are better than the referees at judging and doing it and having that open open debate and then going to the grounds and going to the managers and chatting. I even brought in uh, a panel of match delegates who were former managers and players who still exist, go to the ground, listen to what the referees got to see pre and post match, talk to the managers and then award a mark to the to the referee, you know. And, and in that sense, that got out of the scenario of policeman, policing, policeman 
sorry, <laughs> uh, and brought a degree of transparency in it. But I think we've a long way to go. I think more recently, some of the law changes have not actually been trialed sufficiently, in my opinion, and we only get them. But we get them under the microscope of, of the Premier League. The, we have to recognise the Premier League is being to 211 territories around the world, 22 cameras at every game, minimum, and, and uh, a lot of ex-players who are pundits and ex-referees who are pundits, all adding to the mix. And uh, I think sometimes there is scope for a great deal of improvement in terms of the laws of the game that, that bring them into a modern environment. You know, I mean, look, I, I don't know what it costs to go and watch Arsenal when we get back to real times. But let's say it costs 40 quid a game, 45 quid a game. And, um, and I go to, to watch... I go to the theatre. Don't worry, Keith. When you come to Arsenal, it's on me. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. Let me say that. Let's say if we go to uh, watch a theatre, a, a show in London, and we pay the same amount of quid. I don't know. Equivalent 45. Let's say it's Phantom of the Opera in Michael Crawford. So I'm going back a bit. If Michael Crawford hits a bum no, he doesn't get sent off. I'm still seeing Michael Crawford. I'm still getting entertainment. And football's got to move into the world of its entertainment at the, at the elite level. And you want to retain 22 players. And ultimately, even though I've defended the referee and I've told you the laws and everything, we cannot be happy with the fact that a player has been sent off for what took place last night. Football has got to review this situation and it's got to say, that is not what we wanted. What we wanted red cards for, really, were to, to, to take out, if you like, those players that are out to injure others. So for me, I think there's got to be a fundamental review and thinking about what's got to take place. How often are we, Ari, talking about players diving and... and uh, post-match review and penalising. Because it does make the life for defenders that much more difficult. Of course. Players do, players do go down easy. Is that good for the game? Why have we got into a situation that a player who's touched or feels a touch goes to ground easily? He goes to ground easily because referees are not giving him a penalty kick if he keeps on his feet. Yeah, that's the root cause so, of it all, isn't it? Yeah, so that question asked is a really important question. And that is, I don't think there is sufficient debate between managers, top-level coaches, referees, players, administrators, if you like, to say, if at the end of the day, is the product that we're seeing, because that's what it is, we're in a business world, is that what we really want to see? No, we want to see you know, and I don't, I don't think it is either. No, it certainly isn't. Um, a big thank you to Azzy for your, your super chat question. They say, would you like to see more ex-pros become referees? Do you think that's something that ex-pros should explore? And should the, the PGMOL maybe be giving ex-players an incentive to do that? One of the great difficulties here is that um, the FA are the holders of, like the holders of the, the license of referees. And there is an insistence that they go through the same process as any other referee. And that is, look, if I take my own case, I was 12 years refereeing at grassroots level before I got the professional level. So it's a long apprenticeship. People like, you know, people like Michael Oliver have probably done eight years and, and that's the norm. But I argue, with the, I went to the PFA John Brown and said, look, I, this is a route that we have to take. We should be encouraging. And therefore, if you've been a professional player, you're fit, you're mobile, you understand the game from a player's perspective, you know, can we turn you into the, into the game peak keeper? Can we actually say, right, okay, let us balance those skill sets that you've got against the years of a, a, a young lad refereeing in the park or girl, having to go through the mill of, you know, the league 
the league things, the, the seven or eight stages in, in a refereeing career. So for me, I think that you can get players who are have not made it in the academies now, who've been through a great deal of training physically, understand sports science, understand the game to some degree, and then you can train them to become professional referees. So my answer is, I'd love to see it because there is a point. If you look at someone like uh, in the past, Bob Matheson from Bolton was a, a former professional uh, goalkeeper and he became an international referee. Um, we had uh, George McCabe, who, who was a Sheffield based international referee, former player with Sheffield Wednesday. And Mike Lowe was the same. The late Mike Lowe was also a professional player. So they, when they finished their careers, they were young enough because they were offloaded fairly quick. They were young enough to say, right, I'm going to become a referee. I want to be involved in the game and went through that eight, nine, 10, 11 years apprenticeship. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You make some great points. And it's, it's nice to see some of the comments in the chat as well. 28 Guy Happy says, nice to see honest opinions from Keith. It's a pity the ex-refs on Sky Sports don't do the same. Um, yeah, it has been a... Well, bre- let me come in on that, Harry. Go ahead. The, well, those those ex-referees on Sky are invariably paid by the PJMOL. There you go. There I you mean, go. I'm independent. Uh, you know, I mean, I I have a view. I've always... You know, I've addressed uh, fans forums, even when I was boss of the PJMOL, and my bosses used to say to me, what are you doing that for? And I'd go, well, I get a feedback. I get information. Ultimately, Ari, at the end of the day, we all love this game. We want it to succeed, and we want fairness. And where the law is wrong, even though I've defended it, it, we have to then have the input to say, these things need to change. And the game's got to listen. And with handball, they they listen. What was amazing was when we all said, in law, Rodri, a couple of weeks ago, was offside when he came from a miles offside position and then put the player off. Um, He's not interfered because that's how the law was written. And then immediately within a few days, we've got IFAB on the case, Premier League on the case, and saying, right, different interpretation that will be penalized in the future yeah. and so yeah. in my position as pj Moyle boss i used to say and i give you an example when i retired on the year that i retired harry we had 63 red cards and i was very unhappy with that in syria A, it was 145 and in la liga it was 163 red cards so you know whilst we criticize our referees red cards generally and yellow cards are generally held in the referee's pocket pocket, and players respond in a positive manner and this morning i you know i said in my telegraph column I, i think somebody from the pjmol should go into arsenal and talk specifically to the manager with david louise as well and say, look, how can how can you avoid that in the future? I've done that in the past. There's no there's openness, there's transparency. Other managers knew that that was a role that I took on. It wasn't trying to, you know, be fair to one and and not to the other team. It was it was to be even handed. But then a manager could pick the phone up and say, you know, uh, I've had this happen. Explain to me how your referee can justify it. And I and I would say. I can't. I can't justify that. The referee's made a mistake. And I'll deal with it. Yeah. And the following yeah. week, you wouldn't have a game. But, but people would have had respect for you because of that. And I'm sure, you know, some of the managers you've spoken about that you went and had these conversations with, or I'm sure got on the phone to you about certain decisions, knowing that you've kind of said it was a mistake and we're going to deal with it. I think can make can help a manager put it behind them and just get on with what their job is and what they're supposed to be doing. Whereas the way it is now, where everybody's passing the blame onto somebody else, um, you know, and, and trying to escape all all discussion about it, it's it's that's what's so frustrating about it. And I know we've run well over the time, Keith, and and I thank you for <laughs> that. But um, I just wanted to put one more question to you. Yeah, sure. 
which has been asked by a few people in the in the live chat. So I wanted to make sure I got this one in. Um, would you like to see referees face the media after matches like managers do, like players do to explain their decisions? Do you think that would be productive or counterproductive? Well, I, I took all the referees onto a media training course with the view that this would happen. And uh, in, in my period, it happened for like two weeks. And I think we had one referee come on to explain why he'd issued a red card, Harry. And the outcome was that the club where the player had been dismissed was very, very unhappy because they're saying, just a minute, the referee's not giving us the chance to appeal, not having the chance to, do, to debate things. I think there's got to be more for... I think what is important is that people like... Dermot Gallagher and Peter Walton, whoever they are, and, you know, there's, there's people like Mark Elsie and the like uh, that should be used. But they've got to be independent with their own view. They've got to be, look, are you happy with that sending off? I, I got the impression from some of the tweets that I received today, Harry, with my comments in the Daily Telegraph, that I was sitting pretty and saying, oh, I'm very happy because the referee's got it right and he's writing law and all that goes with it. I was far from that. I'm troubled by the fact that a player on a, uh, a paper sort of scenario, a paper thin challenge, if you like, if he made the challenge, has been penalised with a red card. It's harsh. And is it good for football? No. Did it have an impact on the outcome? Well, any time you send a player off, it has an, an impact on the outcome. Do you feel about it? Look, if you're passionate about the game, I will always go back to the day I sent off Tony Gale because in a in a 50-year career in refereeing, that still irks me. It still irks me that somebody changed the interpretation of law three days before that game. The previous week, Tony Gale would not have had a free kick awarded against him. I would have applied an advantage. But in this situation, now the interpretation says red card. And this is where then it started me saying, we've got to we've got to be transparent, we've got to inform, we've got to take in the views to say, look, let's have a balanced discussion and then determine what impact can be done to actually say, look, this law needs tweaking or this interpretation needs tweaking. I'd be very interested to see over the next few days the outcome because I think uh, whilst I can argue, as I've said before, that the sending off of David Luiz uh, justifies the law to some degree, it's not the right outcome yeah. for me yeah. as a fan. Completely agree. And, and you've made some great points. And, and as always, it's been fascinating talking to you, Keith. Um, a massive thank you, because as I said, I know we were, only, we were going to do 30 minutes. We've almost done double that. So I really appreciate you giving us the time. And I'm sure we'll speak again uh, later on, maybe in the season uh, down the yeah. line, if, if uh, and we can kind of reassess where we're at in terms of... Um, of the the whole uh, VAR thing, the interpretation of the laws. Uh, the guests in the chat are absolutely loving it. Um, they're all saying thank you as well, Keith, for um, taking the time to speak to us. And um, thank you all to uh, you guys as well for all watching us as well. Make sure you smash the like button if you haven't. If you want to become a member and get access to more brilliant content, uh, make sure you click the link in the description. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. My thanks once again to the brilliant Keith Hackett and we'll be back very, very soon with more Arsenal and Football Talk. Until then, cheers. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler and you're listening to Harry Simeon.